Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Temple Employed Bar Forum. Uh, as you will have seen from the programme tonight, it's a combination in our short but best traditions of an opportunity to hear a stimulating talk on a topical subject combined with alcohol. Uh, <laughs> the topic tonight is prosecuting and defending before international courts. And our speaker, Master Cayley, uh, is preeminently qualified to speak on those subjects. He's currently the UK's Director of Service Prosecutions. He was the international co-prosecutor of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal in Cambodia from 2009 until 2013. And prior to that, he was a senior trial attorney at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Court in The Hague between 2001 and 2007. Uh, you will see from the bio uh, in your program tonight uh, that he has a wealth of international experience with a variety <coughs> of institutions. But let me assure you, and to mangle the newly minted phrase of the immortal Roger Daltrey, it's not like being run by FIFA. Uh, Master Cayley. Thank you very much indeed. I, I'm going to pitch my remarks tonight at a sort of, not a basic level, but assuming that many of you have no experience. There are a number of uh, individuals in the room tonight who have a lot of experience. Uh, Judge Joanna Corner, who led me in two cases at the ICTY. Paul Rogers, I think Diana Ellis is here somewhere, who uh, defended when I was prosecuting at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. So you can also speak to them about this work uh, at the drinks afterwards. But essentially, I'm going to assume that the majority of people here tonight don't have a lot of knowledge uh, about this area. So in November of 2011, so over seven years ago now, in Southeast Asia, in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, I opened for the prosecution before an international hybrid tribunal in a case which had charged three octogenarian communist leaders with genocide and crimes against humanity. Three elderly, frail, but defiant men appeared in the dock. The principal allegation was that they had murdered, worked or starved to death two million of their own citizens. They had together, as co-conspirators, unleashed a program of national social reform a program so radical, so violent, so unforgiving that it would exterminate over 25% of their own population and reverse the development of Cambodia back to the Stone Age in just over three years. As we stood there in 2011 with our Cambodian co-prosecutors, we all felt uh, that this was a moment of extraordinary historic significance. Over 30 years had passed since the Khmer Rouge had been toppled from power. And here we were, bringing the remaining leadership to justice. In an imperfect court, it's true, and we can talk about that later. And with the most important co-conspirator, Pol Pot, long dead. But it was nevertheless a moment which even 10 years before would have been very hard to contemplate. My journey in this field of law began in 1992, so over quarter of a century ago now. I was a young army lawyer, a captain, and I had been sent by the British Army to attend a course on international humanitarian law at Liverpool University, a month-long course. International humanitarian law is that body of law which seeks to regulate the conduct of warfare on the treatment of prisoners of war, the treatment of civilians in wartime, the treatment of the sick and wounded. It also seeks to place limits on the methods and means of warfare. The course included looking at the international crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. At that time, in 1992, I recall feeling very powerfully that while these offenses had an international status, uh, they had a noble and just foundation, there were no international courts in which these crimes could be prosecuted. And there were very few domestic prosecutions either. So it really was law in theory 
and not in practice. And I think we all felt that at the time, all of those members of the, the Armed Forces lawyers who were on the course. I remember feeling it all felt rather cynical, particularly in the face of an ongoing and very destructive civil war in the former Yugoslavia. Then something really rather remarkable happened. By 1993, the war in Yugoslavia had been raging for nearly two years. That's, obviously, these are all now independent states. That was the original federal Yugoslavia. It was becoming irrefutable that in Croatia and Bosnia, there were mass killings of civilians taking place. The systematic detention and torture of men of military age in concentration camps and the widespread rape of female members of the civilian population. These were the means and methods of this terrible war. Also, the practice of ethnic cleansing, a euphemistic phrase used to mask the horrors of the forcible displacement of innocent civilians from their homes by acts of murder, rape, serious injury, and destruction of civilian property. The United Nations seemed absolutely paralyzed in its ability to stop the spreading conflict in Yugoslavia. And then, on the 25th of May, 1993, the Security Council, determining that the situation in the former Yugoslavia, the ongoing war, and the human rights ab abuses which were being widely reported were a threat to international peace and security within the meaning of the UN Charter, and resolved under Chapter 7 of the Charter to create an international tribunal which would bring to justice those responsible for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia since 1991. This was Resolution 827. Within two years, so by 1995, I had been seconded by the British Army and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to the Office of the Prosecutor to the of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Initially, it was envisaged that I would go for a period of six months, which would eventually become 10 years. I resigned my commission uh, and stayed on working for the UN. The early days in that court were a really inspiring time. I, mean, I was a young lawyer. Um, the administration in Washington, D.C. was full of hope and idealism. Yes, there really was such a time. Um, and President Clinton sent a significant number of experienced prosecutors from justice and defense to support the tribunal as it struggled to its feet. We all felt like pioneers. The last international courts had been at Nuremberg and Tokyo. So the law had developed since, 19, since 1945, not a great deal, to be fair. So there was much legal research to be done on the elements of the offenses that we were dealing with and also the modes of criminal liability. Also, the rules of procedure and evidence of the court had to be tested to see if the court could really function. And most of all, we had to have individuals to prosecute. Because without effective prosecutions, the court would simply become a fig leaf to mask the mo these terrible atrocities that the UN was incapable of stopping through diplomacy and other international legal measures. My most powerful memories of the ICTY are of the Colonel General Radoslav Kerstic case, which would be the first trial of a charge of genocide before the Yugoslav Tribunal. I was junior prosecuting counsel in the case, which was the first case to address events at Srebrenica in northeastern Bosnia in July of 1995. What in fact took place in and around Srebrenica was a crime or series of crimes of absolutely shocking magnitude. So in July of 1995, camera just moving. Okay. Srebrenica, I'm sorry the people probably over there can't see it, it was a very small Bosnian Muslim enclave surrounded by Bosnian Serb forces. Um, in that fateful, fateful month in July of 1995, the Bosnian Serb forces would take the enclave. They would murder up to 8,000 captured Bosnian Muslim men and boys and forcibly displace 25,000 civilians trapped in the enclave. 
in the context of the war in the former Yugoslavia, these events were, and still are, absolutely notorious in their scale and brutality. The investigation at Srebrenica was wide-ranging and was groundbreaking in many respects. The dead were buried in a series of mass graves in and around Srebrenica. These mass graves were then subsequently robbed by the Bosnian Serb army in order to conceal the scale of the crimes by removing the bodies to more remote grave sites in eastern Bosnia, the perpetrators hoping that they could conceal what they'd done from the eyes of the world. And that actually there is a secondary grave site. And you can tell that it's a secondary grave site because the bodies, the body parts have commingled. So in the process of moving from the primary grave site to the secondary grave site, obviously the bodies fall apart um, in the movement. Satellite and aerial imagery provided by a UN member state to the Yugoslav tribunal led us to the mass grave sites because expert analysts could look at these images and see where Earth had been disturbed in and around Srebrenica, thus directing us to sites that we would excavate. And indeed, when we did excavate many of these sites, uh, we discovered many bodies, thousands of bodies. Um, the bodies that were recovered often had their hands tied behind their backs like this one. They were blindfolded like this one. Gunshot entry wounds were often to the back of the head. Not always, but often. So classic summary execution. There's a body with its hands tied. While there had been much debate, while there's been much debate subsequently about the legal characterization of events in Srebrenica, the court found that the mass killings of the male population was genocide. In an evidential sense, it was an absolutely overwhelming case. The evidence from a handful of survivors and the relatives of the dead was emotionally charged and distressing. One witness I recall was this lady, uh, Mrs. Masada Malagic, who drove home to everybody the scale of the killing in her account of what happened. She was living with her family in the Srebrenica enclave in July of 1995. She was six months pregnant when the enclave fell to the Bosnian Serbs. She was expelled with her 11-year-old son and every other male member of her family was captured and murdered. She explained it like this to the court. So her father-in-law, Omar Malagic, born in 1926, his three sons, Salka Malagic, born in 1948, who was Mrs. Malagic's husband, Osman Malagic, born in 1953, and Jaffa Malagic, born in 1957, his three grandsons, Elvia Magalic, born in 1973, and Admir Magalic, born in 1976, who were Mrs. Malik Masada Malagic's own two sons, and Samir Malagic, born in 1975, who was her nephew. So three generations of a single family exterminated over a matter of a few days. And this was a common experience. Another witness I will mention uh, here was barely 17 years old at the time of these events. He survived the massacre of over 1,500 men and boys at a place called Petkovsi Dam. <coughs> Known as Witness O at trial for reasons of his and his family's personal security. So this young man recounted how he was captured outside Srebrenica on the afternoon of 14th of July 1995 and taken with a group of other prisoners to an empty school in northeastern Bosnia. When darkness fell, Witness O heard men from the other classrooms in the school being called out in small groups. When these men got down in front of the school, he heard bursts of automatic gunfire. This went on until about midnight. Then soldiers came to the classrooms in which the boy was held prisoner and ordered the prisoners out two by two. He was stripped to the waist, his hands tied behind his back, and he was placed on a covered lorry with other prisoners. They were then driven off into the countryside to the execution site when he arrived, he saw hundreds of dead. Witness O was dragged from the lorry with other men and forced to form a row. The shooting started from behind them. And I recall him saying to the judges that he thought that he would die very quickly and not suffer. And he said, and I remember this very well, and I just thought that my mother would never know where I ended up. Miraculously, the boy, although seriously injured, survived and crawled across all these many hundreds of bodies to free another man 
who had also survived and with whom he subsequently escaped. At the end of his evidence in court in 2000, so 18 years ago now, when asked by the presiding judge if he had anything to say in conclusion, he said this. And this was not in his statement, not prepared. He simply said this. And this is a boy 16, 17 years old at the time of these events. From all of whatever I had said and what I saw, I could come to the conclusion that this was extremely well organized. It was systematic killing and that the organizers of that do not deserve to be at liberty. And if I had the right and the courage in the name of all of those innocents, all of those victims, I would forgive the actual perpetrators of the executions because they were misled, that's all. So this young man, barely an adult, spoke of forgiveness in the face of mass murder. There was a stunned silence as his evidence concluded. It was a remarkable and powerfully defiant moment because he did not seek vengeance, he wanted justice. General Kerstich, the accused in the case, was convicted of genocide for Srebrenica, as were a number of other Bosnian Serb army officers and civilian officials, including the president of the Bosnian Serb Republic, Radovan Karadic, and the commander of the Bosnian Serb army, Ratko Mladic, that respectively in 2016, 2017. I worked on a number of other cases at the ICTY. I was led by Judge Joanna Corner in two cases. And then in 2005, I moved on from the Yugoslav Tribunal uh, to the Permanent International Criminal Court in The Hague, where I would work on cases arising out of Uganda and Darfur, Sudan. So here, we're looking at the Republic of Sudan here. Sudan is the largest country in Africa by territory. It's two and a half million square kilometers and very little roads. Uh, extremely, I think it's one of the least developed countries in Africa. Um, Darfur itself is a geographically large area comprising approximately 250,000 square kilometers, so a little larger than the United Kingdom, with an estimated population of about 6 million people, and divided, as you can see here, into three administrative areas Shamal Darfur, North Darfur, Zalik Darfur, West Darfur, and Jalik Darfur, South Darfur. <coughs> the causes of the war in these three Darfur states remains extremely complex. Suffice to say from 2001, 2002, there had been a protracted armed conflict between the Sudanese government armed forces and rebel forces in Darfur. The rebel forces were largely recruited from the Fur, Zagawa and Masili tribes of Darfur. While strict Arab and African identity can be blurred in Darfur, these three tribes were recognized as African rather than <coughs> Arab and all of Islamic faith, like the government forces. Now, the Americans, you may recall the US, assumed that it was Arabs of Islamic faith attacking Africans of Christian faith. Not at all. Uh, they, like the Arabs, were of Islamic faith. The government of Sudan responded to the rebels with armed force, employing both the regular army and local Arab militia known as Janjaweed. The Janjaweed were the government's proxy force and essentially their shock troops in Darfur. An Arab militia, attacks were often made by the Sudanese government forces acting together with the Janjaweed. Because the rebels were recruited from local villages, many of these attacks by the Sudanese army and the Janjaweed were directed at these villages, and thus in many instances against unarmed civilians. Sufficiently alarming reports of widespread human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law led the Security Council of the United Nations to conclude that events in Darfur were a threat to international peace and security. And so, in September of 2004, the Security Council requested the Secretary General to rapidly establish an international commission of inquiry to investigate reports of violations of international humanitarian law and human rights law 
in Darfur by all parties to determine also whether acts of genocide had occurred and to identify the perpetrators of such violations with a view to ensuring that those responsible were held accountable. That commission, known as the Kasasi Commission, reported back to the Secretary General in January of 2005. Kasasi found that thousands of civilians had been killed. Women and girls had been raped on a colossal scale and villages had literally been razed to the ground, like this one. About 1.8 million people had been forcibly displaced internally and had become refugees. That's roughly the entire violent displacement of the populations of the cities of Liverpool and Birmingham. Gassasi also recommended that the Security Council refer the situation in Darfur to the International Criminal Court. So, on the 31st of March of 2005, the Security Council, acting under its Chapter 7 powers, duly referred the situation to the International Criminal Court. I was assigned as a senior prosecutor to the case. The immediate difficulty that we faced was that while Sudan was a member of the United Nations, it was not a member of the International Criminal Court. It had not signed up to the Rome Statute. And so it claimed that we had no legal jurisdiction. They simply told us, you have no legal jurisdiction in this case. The investigation which commenced in June of 2005 was challenging. We were going to have to investigate both historic and ongoing crimes being committed in a difficult and remote part of Africa with a continuing conflict and a government that was not going to cooperate with us at any level. We interviewed uh, refugees in neighboring Chad, so here to the west of Darfur, uh, and we located witnesses across the globe who could speak to criminal responsibility, so individuals who had knowledge of the government who had had to leave Sudan and who would speak to us. We had to be very careful, of course, that they didn't have their own political agendas in giving evidence against the current regime. Now, the evidence that we gathered clearly demonstrated that crimes have been committed by the government and its proxy forces, and also by rebel forces, but at a much lower level when compared to the crimes of the government. In April 2007, warrants of arrest were issued against the Deputy Minister of Interior, Ahmed Haroun, responsible for security in Darfur, and an Arab militia leader known as Ali Koshib. These warrants were for events in four settlements in West Darfur, so in Garb Darfur where civilians had been murdered, tortured, raped, and seriously injured, civilian housing and property had been pillaged and destroyed, and villagers forced to flee their homes. In 2009 and 2010, warrants of arrest were issued against the President of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, for genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And in 2012, the Minister of Defense of Sudan, Abdul Hussein, was the subject of a warrant of arrest for crimes against humanity and war crimes. One rebel leader has also been charged with war crimes. To date, no Sudanese officials have been arrested to answer for these crimes. In 2007, I left the ICC and was instructed by this man, the former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor, to defend him in his case before the Special Court for Sierra Leone. I was led by Courtney Griffiths and spent nearly two years on the case while also defending in a case before the ICTY. This court, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, like the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, which it predated, was a hybrid tribunal, mixing international staff with local Sierra Leonean judges, prosecutors and court staff. The court was established to address gross violations of international humanitarian law committed in Sierra Leone civil war which raged from 1991 to 2001. It was the first modern tribunal to sit in the country where the crimes took place. And that was really important. That was also really important in Cambodia, that the court was in the country where the crimes took place so that the local population could come to the court and see the process as it took place. Charles Taylor was eventually charged with 11 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes. While he was president of neighboring uh, Liberia, so you can see 
So here's Sierra Leone, Liberia, here. So while Taylor had been the president of neighboring Liberia, it was alleged that he had supported uh, one of the major rebel groups of the Civil War in Sierra Leone, the, Re the Revolutionary United Front, the RUF. The rebels had murdered, mutilated, and tortured the civilian population of Sierra Leone. In April 2012, Taylor was convicted on all 11 counts, predominantly on the basis that he had aided and abetted the crimes. This mode of liability, relied on by the court, reflected the most common difficulty in these kinds of cases, where the alleged perpetrator of the crimes is a high-level leader, president, a head of state in this case, who is physically remote from the crime scenes, and his or her involvement in the crimes is principally the provision of supplies like ammunition and food, and in this case, some advice that he'd given to the physical perpetrators. His conviction was upheld on appeal and he was sentenced to 50 years imprisonment. I realized, in fact, during this case, how tough these cases are to defend. The visible injuries of the victims in this war were horrific, with the severing of limbs being a signature crime of the rebels. Here you see mother and daughter, both with severed limbs. You can imagine the effect when these poor people appeared before the court. Even with professional judges, the thoughts go into your head, somebody's got to be responsible for this. My advice to Courtney Griffiths at the time had been to agree all of the victim evidence, just accept the written statements of these crimes, and we just concentrate on attacking the linkage evidence between Taylor, this very senior accused, and the physical perpetrators. Let's now finally return to Southeast Asia and Cambodia. As I said earlier, I was international co-prosecutor of the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, a court specially established to address the crimes of the Khmer Rouge, committed in Cambodia between 1975 and 1979. I was at the court between 2009 and 2013. Much of what happened in Cambodia in the 1970s, the mass killings, the genocide of the Muslim Cham, the Vietnamese, was frankly an unintended consequence of the Vietnam War. Cambodia gained its independence from France in November of 1953. The Khmer Rouge, or Red Khmer, had its origins in the 1960s as the armed wing of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, Kampuchea being the name that the Communists gave to Cambodia. US carpet bombing of the settlers of Cambodia, this is the Vietnam, the Vietnam border. The North Vietnamese forces would often enter into Cambodia on a poorly policed border in order to sort of rest and recuperate. So the Americans took the decision to bomb the border. Um, Whilst they were aiming at North Vietnamese fighters, what they did in reality was cause massive uh, Cambodian civilian casualties. And by this indiscriminate bombing, the Americans provided the Khmer Rouge with an extremely effective recruiting tool. tool. Cambodian citizens literally flocked to the protection of the communists. A bitter and protracted civil war ensued between the military government of Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge with Khmer Rouge forces finally taking over the capital, Phnom Penh, and therefore the nation as a whole in April of 1975. I've mentioned the leader of the Khmer Rouge already, Salah Saar, whose party name was Pol Pot. He was, as I've said already, dead by the time we came to these trials. When he came to power, Pol Pot and his fellow conspirators, which included Nguyen Chia, who was Pol Pot's deputy, Sun Pan, the president of Kampuchea, Ying Sari, the foreign minister, Ying Tarit, his wife, the minister of health. These individuals, together with Pol Pot and others, quickly set about transforming Cambodia, now renamed Kampuchea, into what they hoped would be an agrarian utopia. This centrally planned social transformation would lead to one of the greatest humanitarian tragedies 
of the 20th century. Pol Pot isolated his people from the rest of the world and set about emptying the cities, abolishing money, private property and religion, and setting up rural collectives. Anyone suspected of being an intellectual or a member of the middle classes was labelled a counter-revolutionary and tortured and executed in special security centres. Often, people were condemned for wearing glasses or knowing a foreign language. Sadistic violence, killing, starvation, and forced labor were acceptable and promoted ways of achieving the aims of the Khmer Rouge. The investigations that took place were even more demanding than those that we did in Darfur. The Khmer Rouge Tribunal was finally established only in 2006 after 10 years <coughs> of negotiations between the United Nations and the Cambodian government. So by the time investigations had commenced, over a quarter of a century had passed since the crimes of the Khmer Rouge had been committed. Many survivors and witnesses had died. Any forensic evidence of mass killings was long gone. But fortunately, fortunately, significant document collections of the Khmer Rouge existed. The Khmer Rouge, like the Nazis in Germany, kept meticulous records of their crimes. Now, interestingly, these four individuals were all charged. Only these two individuals were convicted. Yang Suri died during the first trial. Ying Turit, her case was severed um, out of the main trial because she was diagnosed with senile dementia. Diana Ellis, in fact, represented her, so she can I'll answer any questions you have on that. And that was actually quite a, that was quite a, um, that finding was something that did give legitimacy to the court because you can imagine in Cambodia the court system is incredibly primitive. The judges, the prosecutors are all corrupt. They're all connected to the government. And this was, you know, we were able to basically establish that she was not mentally fit to stand trial and it was severed out of the main trial. Whereas in the domestic courts, many people with serious mental health issues were being tried before the courts without any of these kinds of findings. So, you know, there were, um, in this very difficult court, one or two incidences, episodes of sort of advancement in, in human rights and court procedures, which were you know, refreshing um, and encouraging to see. Of the vast network of special security centres or death camps run by the Khmer Rouge, the most notorious was this place at Tul Slang, a school in Phnom Penh, where as many as 17,000 men, women, and children were imprisoned and murdered during the regime's less than four years in power. Also known as Camp S21, entire families were brought en masse. Here you see a young woman with her baby. Each prisoner was photographed on entry by the Khmer Rouge security services, and those photographs now line the walls of Tul Slang which today is a museum. Meticulous records were kept. Prisoners were shackled permanently to the floors in tiny cells like this. They were subjected to medieval forms of torture, to electrocutions, to suffocations, bogus medical experiments in the form of living autopsies, savage beatings and then murdered. This is a painting, actually, which was done by one of the few survivors from Tul Slang. So he did this from memory um, after he was released from the prison and the Khmer Rouge had fallen from power. Under torture, false confessions were made by many prisoners implicating more innocent Khmers who were then arrested themselves. And so this madness and killing just went on and on and on almost self-feeding. On Christmas Day 1978, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia and Phnom Penh fell to them on the 9th of January 1979. The Khmer, Ru Ru Khmer Rouge rule came to an end, although they went on um, fighting a civil war against the authorities in Phnom Penh, the Khmer Rouge did, until the late 1990s. Um, that's an extract from the 48 Genocide Convention. What people find very surprising is that the vast majority of the two million in dead of Cambodia were not victims of genocide at all because for genocide to take place, 
The killing, or one of the other enumerated acts that constitute genocide, must be done with the intention to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Now, the vast majority of Cambodians lost their lives because they were identified as counter-revolutionaries by the Khmer Rouge. And as such, they were a political group. And that group was never recognized as a protected group within the Genocide Convention because, of course, in the late 1940s, there were many states, member states of the UN, that were persecuting members of their own community upon the basis of politics. Now, there was genocide committed in Cambodia against the Muslim Cham. They were an Islamic minority uh, living in Cambodia, and they were targeted by the Khmer Rouge and almost, in fact, wiped out completely because of their religion, because of Islam. Also, the Vietnamese minority living in Cambodia, who were, in fact, totally exterminated. And thus, this, this was also genocide because they were a national group, so falling within the convention. As to, the other, as to the vast majority of Cambodians who were killed, of course, they were victims of multiple crimes against humanity, even though they were not victims of genocide. So, some concluding remarks. The ad hoc tribunals, like the Yugoslav Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal, and the hybrid courts, like the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, are really now all closed, except for the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Those other courts, so Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone, they do have residual bodies um, which are addressing the legacy issues of the court, so dealing um, with matters of detention, etc. Now, when you look at the ICTY, the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the ICTY, they actually have been remarkably successful organisations. Many people disagree with that conclusion, but I think it's true in most respects. Criticism can actually be levelled at all of them. For example, the ICTY's failure to bring about ethnic reconciliation in Bosnia. Well, I question whether prosecutions were brought, were ever brought primarily with the aim of reuniting the disparate ethnic groups of Bosnia after the war. They were brought these cases to bring justice, uh, to bring individuals to justice who were responsible for the worst crimes of the war. And that that happened. That really happened. If you look at ICTY, that court was really set up to try Karadzic and Mladic. And that's what happened in the end. They were both tried and convicted. Now, the permanent international court, the permanent international criminal court in The Hague, faces enormous challenges. Powerful states like China, Russia, and the United States are not members of the court, thus weakening its support and reach. Indeed, the US has very vocally condemned the court. You may have heard John Bolton, Bolton, the national security advisor, basically damning the court. The ICC has been somewhat unfairly criticized for predominantly only acting in Africa. And it has also had some fairly spectacular prosecution failures of late. In these cases, the prosecutor could prove mass criminality, real horror, but it just didn't have the evidence, the prosecutor did not have the evidence to link those crimes to the leaders on trial, who were not the physical perpetrators of the crimes. The challenge that I referred to in the Taylor case, in Cambodia, we were fortunate because we had fantastic, vast document collections and some insider witnesses who linked these high-level accused to the crimes on the ground. So that was uh, nearly 18 years of my career, all told, and likely, um, I think now, the most rewarding and challenging work I've ever done. The outcomes of these cases matters a very great deal. Not that outcomes don't matter in domestic work, but here, I think, you truly felt a level of responsibility and professional fulfillment uh, that was unprecedented. Of course, that period from 1994, 1995 to 2010 saw a massive growth in international courts and trials. That growth has largely ceased, most remaining substantive work being with the International Criminal Court, the Permanent Court, and the Khmer Rouge Tribunal to a lesser extent, also a court um, called the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, essentially established to deal with the murder of Rafik Hariri uh, in Lebanon, 
um, and also this Kosovo special court set up by the European Union effectively <coughs> to deal with crimes committed by Kosovo Albanians against the Serbs, but much less activity than there was even five or six years ago. So I think the period of growth and idealism in this field of law is largely over, at least for now. As human beings, I think the perspective we have of the world is of the day, the week, the month, the year, our own short lives. But I believe in respect of these really serious crimes and their absolute effective prohibition through enforcement, we've really got to accept that we've got to play a much longer game. We've got to adopt a greater vision, looking way over the horizon, beyond our own short, short lives, where we might be in 100 years' time rather than where we, where we are now in 2019. And the policymakers, I think, have really got to plan on that basis. The events which I've spoken about here this evening happened in the lifetime of most of us who are present here tonight. And of course, similar events have been ongoing in Myanmar and Syria. Whatever the present day limitations are, I sincerely believe that all of those, all of the people here present tonight that have done this kind of work, still care passionately about it being done properly and continuing to address and eliminate this cynical inevi inevitability we have as human beings of destroying each other from age to age. We really can stop that, I think. Um, happy to talk about opportunities in this field to anybody that's interested. There are opportunities out there. It's more limited than it was um, 10 years ago, but, but there are opportunities both in the residual bodies in these courts that are still functioning. It's immensely rewarding work. The people here that have done it will tell you that. Uh, people often talk about almost as a sort of legal addiction, uh, this kind of work. People just can't get enough of it. Um, but now certainly I will conclude there and answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. I'm going to invite questions in a moment, but before we do that, I want to thank Master Cayley for what has been uh, not only informative, but uh, in many respects a very moving address. My practice for more years than I care to remember, over 40 years now, has been about money. Money has no guilt. Frankly, I have little guilt about how it's run, it carries a sort of responsibility, but in truth, uh, really not a very great deal if you act for people who can afford to lose, uh, as well as who seek to win. But once in a while, we all need to remember why it is we became lawyers. And the sense of pride, whether as prosecutor or defender, in a criminal case, and uh, in this case, Uber uh, case, is one that should simply never leave us. And with that, uh, I hope not overly sentimental point, I want to turn to this. Um, the thought, uh, Andrew, that, that struck me as you were describing the meticulous record keeping was, uh, and I'm trying to remember and failing, uh, who used the phrase, the banality of evil. The uh, post, I have now to say, Second World War uh, trials came on really rather fast, and the disposals, if I can describe them as that, were rapid. That is not the hallmark of the uh, trials that you've described. Is the time it takes to investigate and to bring on these cases something, in your opinion, that in any way undermines the process? Yes, it can do. I think if you look at the Yugoslav Tribunal, when, when I mean, there's other people who work there probably may also have an opinion on this. I think actually those cases we felt it was taking a long time to investigate, but we actually did them relatively quickly. I mean, certainly if you look at Srebrenica, uh, that happened in July of 1995. The first prosecution took place four 
years later. So the evidence was relatively fresh. Uh, we could recover forensic evidence. Memories were still fresh, so people could give reliable evidence of what took place. Of course, in Cambodia, you had the problem of an entire generation passing before we even started investigating. So as I said, you know, there was no forensic evidence. A lot of the witnesses had died. People's memories were very hazy. The quality of the case was not as good as those cases that were investigated relatively quickly after the event. So I agree. Of course, the longer the period extends after you know, they take place to investigation and prosecution, yet yeah, cases decay. I agree. Yes. Thank you. Of course. The floor is yours. Yes. You hinted at the possibility of what seemed to be a lack of strategic thinking because we're living our prosaic lives. Uh, do you think that the, if you agree that if there is a lack of strategic thinking, that should also take into account climate change and that may be a cause of future uh, criminality and conflicts in the battle for resources and livable places. It's an interesting comment you make because in fact if you look at the, at the war in Darfur, actually climate change has something to do with that war, believe it or not. So that's a specific example I can give you because the Sahara Desert is moving and with that movement, it, it, it essentially, so, so within that part of Africa, there was a, a fair degree of, sort of symbiosis between uh, African farmers who, generally speaking, were sedentary, you know, they would stay in one place, and then Arab farmers who tended to deal in livestock and camels. And generally speaking, the, the Arab farmers would bring their livestock to feed on African farmers' land, but because of the change in climate and the movement of the Sahara, lush, fertile ground was reducing. And this led to a hell of a lot of tension between the Arabs and the Africans in Darfur, which actually fed into the war. So that's an, I can't give you any other example, but that's certainly an example of a case where, yes, climate change fed into, certainly contributed to tension between two different ethnic groups in a part of Africa and actually help fuel the conflict between them. So yes, we do need to look at that as well. I'm not quite sure what the answer is, how we do that, how we get international courts thinking about that, but that's an example, yes. Over here. You mentioned a couple of times the uh, linkage between the direct perpetrators and the leadership. I was wondering if you just, could just say some more about the sort of jurisprudence that's been developed by these tribunals um, about the, the degree of linkage that's required. Yeah, I mean, so I think in all of the cases uh, in which I was involved, I can't think, I think, oh, there's one case I was involved where uh, they were physical perpetrators as well. So a number of theories, uh, modes of responsibility have developed, um, one of which was a mode of responsibility developed at the Yugoslav Tribunal uh, called Joint Criminal Enterprise, which is, it has a lot of similarities with conspiracy. Um, there are three forms of it. Um, the last form, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit of detail, is the most uh, controversial because what it basically says is that you can have a group of people who agree, so you could have a, a leadership figure who agrees with physical perpetrators or those giving orders to physical per perpetrators to commit a certain type of crime um, like for example, they agree to forcibly transfer the population. And if it's reasonably foreseeable that murder could result from that forcible transfer, then all the members of the joint criminal enterprise, including the leadership, are responsible for that crime as well. Um, a lot of criticism of that theory of responsibility because it, it's sort of overreaching, incorporating more serious crimes based on, on reasonable foreseeability. So linking leadership 
to crimes that you can't actually prove that they ordered, but you can demonstrate that it was reasonably foreseeable for them to know that those crimes were going to be committed. It's not a theory of responsibility. It's not a mode of responsibility that exists in the International Criminal Court. Another mode of responsibility for leadership figures is what's called command responsibility, uh, which interestingly I'm looking at in respect of a number of domestic crimes. That is a mode of responsibility that can be imposed on both civilian and military leaders where they have effective control of a group of people, generally speaking armed forces. Those individuals commit crimes and the leadership figure who has effective control, you have to prove that the leader has effective control over that group and the leader, it's proven, either failed to prevent crimes taking place or repress crimes or failed to refer crimes for investigation after he or, he or she knew that crimes had been committed. That's unique to international criminal law. You can only uh, be held responsible for the crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes for that mode of responsibility. If you go to the International Criminal Court, the Rome Statute, that has a number of theories of criminal liability uh, which essentially capture leaders, uh, common purpose, co-perpetration, joint criminal purpose. That's not the same as joint criminal enterprise, and at least that's what all the academics say, but frankly, they're very similar forms of criminal responsibility. But if you look at the International Criminal Court, they've had three cases in a row where leaders, high-level leaders, um, have been acquitted uh, because they simply couldn't, you know, they could show massive criminality on the ground, but they couldn't link it to the leadership figure on trial. So it is, without doubt, the most challenging part of these cases. And if you look at the um, Coalition for International Justice, which is the organization looking at crimes in Syria, these, this group of individuals, their former analysts, investigators, and lawyers, mostly from the Yugoslav tribunal, what they did which was really wise, is that they said at the beginning, look, we know that the Syrian government has committed massive crimes. You know, there's no doubt, there's overwhelming evidence, forget that. Let's prove the linkage between the government and the crisis. And my goodness me, have they got some fantastic evidence. Documents, in, I mean, documents linking uh, Assad with crimes on the ground, with people being murdered in security centers, you can link Assad with that. You can show that he knew, basically, what was going on and he approved of it, as did members of his cabinet and people in the security services. So that's what they did. They went after that evidence from the outset, which frankly is the best way of doing these cases. The crimes, you can see, they're terrible, they're easy, generally fairly straightforward to prove. It's the linkage to the highest levels, which is the most complicated part of these cases. Actually, I mean, interestingly, you know, when I went to the Yugoslav tribunal, so I've been in army legal services then for about three years, so not very long. But the one advantage I had actually, there were a couple of uh, prosecutors from the United States. So from there was a guy from the U.S. Marine Corps. There was another chap from the U.S. Army. But the big advantage that I had over other prosecutors is I knew how armies functioned. I knew what the terminology meant. So when documents were translated. I knew what the difference was between a brigade and a battalion. But that's about the only advantage I had. But when everybody else doesn't know, you're, you're, you're in a hugely advantageous position because you understand these things. And as a result of that, people put me in the courtroom because I could speak the language and explain it uh, to the judges, most of whom had absolutely no knowledge of military structures at all. And as the years went by, they brought in experts in this area. But that was the major sort of asset that I had having spent those years in, in the army is I basically understood how armies worked and I, and I was able to cross-examine experts. I remember I cross-examined the expert in the Kerstich trial you know, who, who was called by the defense to explain why their army worked different to every other army in the world. That, you know, it's complete nonsense. And we were able to prove this <coughs> through the documents that we had. And again, he was, I think he was a colonel general in the Yugoslav army. But 
we spoke the same language. We understood each other. And, you know, I could break that down for the courtroom. So that, that was, I was very lucky because that gave me a kind of boost when I turned up at the court. There, were, there weren't, you know, I think there were about three of us. And, and actually the army lawyer from the US, he left very quickly. And then it was just me and the US Marine Corps lawyer. Yeah, so it was an advantage. Andrew, thank you very much, number one. Um, my background is not legal, it's actually psychiatry and psychotherapy. I just, um, I'm curious how traumatic this is for people who are engaged in this kind of work and what sort of safeguards were in place or should be in place, do you think, to avoid burnout and, and these kinds yeah. of things? Careful what I say, because <laughs> there are people here who worked in the field. Actually, um, at, to be honest with you, at the beginning, there was absolutely nothing in place at all. Um, I remember later there was um, a welfare officer that was appointed, but there wasn't really very much provision for it. There was more provision for uh, witnesses who were victims, but that <coughs> actually came later. Um, but no, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of provision, frankly. Yeah, I think Paul has a comment on it. At the very end of the time there, we did have a psychiatrist who came over from the United States who'd started to do some work on secondary trauma, <laughs> and he had done it with police officers mainly who'd been investigating rape cases, for example, and then they started to recognize that the lawyers that were investigating those cases as well, because the Americans have more of a close investigation link to the crimes themselves, um, were also suffering from trauma, but secondary. So they weren't taking the first account, but they were probably dealing with the second account when they were proofing the witnesses, which we don't do, but we do at the tribunal. We proof, we, we proof witnesses, and well, at the ICTY, not so much at the ICC, so there are different differences there. Um, speaking for myself, I think it is a very big issue. Um, I dealt with <coughs> the, the appeal the appeals, so I was one further away from the, in the end, dealing with the judgments and then the appeals in the Popovich case, which was Srebrenica, so it was all of the commanders, not General Kerstich, but, but the other lot, so most of them, the re remainder, for the most part, were dealt with that. I had to open that case on the appeals. It took me an hour to talk about the entire killing spree, and that's a lot of work, studying it, getting it into your head, understanding the full detail of what it is in order to, to take it down into a small piece of the very limited amount of time that you get. So I think, yes, I think it's a real issue. Um, and I certainly found towards the end it was very difficult to read some kind of war stories. I remember reading Captain Corelli's Mandolin. I could hardly get through <coughs> it because there was the killings in Kefalonia there at the end of the prisoners, which reminded me of the Ofchara farm. Um, which was one of the early cases that I worked in. And, I, and I'm dealing with a Liberian case now involving rape and torture and all the rest of it. And when you <coughs> add it up to all the years you've done before prosecuting, I, I do think it's a very significant issue and it's not being dealt with. I think well-being at the bar generally is not being dealt with very well, if I to say that, but I certainly think that is an issue. Sorry if I went on a bit. Yes, Master uh, Madams. I would, could I just add one thing? What I would say, personally, from my own experience, it's not actually the, um, the physical violence that's the traumatic part. I think it's actually the grief of the victims, uh, which is the most powerful. I mean, that's what, you know, when I quoted to you Mrs. Malagic's evidence about her whole family, it's not the, it's not the, the, the physical violence, it, it's the grief that people suffered. The, the, the boy, um, you know, who, who gave evidence lost his whole family. Um, it was the grief, it's not the, the forensic physical evidence. Sorry, Joe, did you want to? No, no I, 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 I was simply going to add that, that um, I, I'm not sure I entirely agree either with Paul or, or um, about the need for psychotherapy for lawyers. Um, but one of the, the, one of the main reasons um, is simply because the cases were so complicated, so huge, and so difficult to do in court that effectively most members of the bar have a shutter that comes down over what you're listening to. 
you hear the words, but you don't actually appreciate them. And uh, as I say, you, the one thing we were all trying to do was manage to get the witness through in the time allowed by the judges. And, and, and you were working so hard at that. Well, that's, I think, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not sure I entirely agree, but can I just admit, sorry, I'm, I know I interrupted you. Andrew, you didn't mention um, Chermak, um, where you defended um, before the... I, I, didn't probably mention, I didn't mention by name, but I mentioned... Yeah, no, by twice. Yeah. But, I mean, you're the only person I know in the best tradition of the English bar who both prosecuted ICTY and defended. Did you find the defending difficult? Yeah, I mean, I, I, two things I'd say. It's interesting, actually, because when I uh, went to defend these cases, I found that people that I'd worked with for years, not, not Joe, actually, I didn't know all them, but people actually stopped speaking to me. Um, because I was defending uh, in cases uh, before the international courts. And I remember specifically actually in the Sierra Leone tribunal where I knew a lot of the prosecutors, people literally ignored me because I started defending, which I thought was you know, very poor and very strange behavior. But that's, people became evangelical in these cases. That's the problem, <coughs> I think probably more so with prosecutors than with defence lawyers. People became absolutely evangelical about these cases. So you know, if you changed sides, you were seen as a traitor. The other thing I've mentioned is what I did say. I think these cases are enormously difficult to defend because the crimes are so terrible. As I, as I said in my remarks, you often got a sense there, sitting as a prosecutor, that there, there was a feeling in the court amongst the judges too, you know, crumbs, some, you know, somebody's got to be responsible for this, and actually, you know, there's a guy in the dock there, um, so he must be responsible. I mean, I exaggerate; it's, it's unfair because I think if you look at the convictions in many of these cases, they are safe. But I think there was an element of that which made it very, very difficult uh, for defence lawyers to operate before these courts, and that you know, was my experience in in the two cases that I have done. Um, it's tough defending in this case. It's tough prosecuting too, um, but, uh, but I think uh, it, it's, it's difficult for defence lawyers for all the reasons that have already been well, discussed. Blood will have blood. Yeah. Yeah. Last so question. Oh, I'll come back to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Greg. Perhaps yeah. on the back of a very fascinating talk, I could just mention that we have the next in our social context of the law lectures on the 1st of April. versus justice, where you get a conflict between those two things in the context of international law. And perhaps I can just turn that into a question and ask you what you think of how you should handle that where there is such a conflict. Yeah. Can you disregard the politics or yeah. is it important to get the best possible legal result by taking the politics out? I mean, people always say, don't they, you know, there cannot be peace without justice. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true, actually. Um, I think justice can aid peace, but I don't think, I think it's a cry that international criminal lawyers, international humanitarian lawyers make. There can't possibly be any peace without justice. I mean, you can look at states where, if you look at South Africa, which had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, didn't have trials, they're relatively successful. If you look at Bosnia, Joe, who spent a lot of time, jo Judge Joe Corn spent a lot of time in Bosnia, working in the local court that was established, the EU-sponsored court, the, what was it called, the, uh, the, the, state, the state, state court, court yeah. which dealt with the sort of mass of war crimes. But if you go to Bosnia, I mean, I was there in 2015 for the 20th anniversary of Srebrenica, and the, the ethnic groups are still not speaking to each other. I mean, people just screaming at each other in these meetings, and the Serbs who turned up from Belgrade, they came into the meeting for five minutes, everybody started screaming at them, you know, all the mothers of Srebrenica who'd lost mm -hmm. relatives, and they left. So actually, it, it hasn't really created reconciliation, but was it ever really established as the only purpose of the court? No, it wasn't. You know, the courts were established to bring people to justice so that in 100 years' time, people can't turn around and say, well, we never dealt with those crimes. So I think it's really difficult, the, the answer to that question. I think you have to look at each individual situation and calibrate you know, what level of justice you, you need. I mean, Uganda is another example where, again, um, they wanted to 
bring the Lord's Resistance Army to justice, but many local politicians, they, they didn't want it, even though Museveni went to the ICC, he referred Uganda to the court, but they wanted, actually we can reconcile this ourselves, we don't need these people being tried in the International Criminal Court, what we need is peace. So they, there were many politicians that were dead against that referral. So I think you've got to look at it, each individual particular conflict, set of facts, it's not one size fits all, it depends on the circumstances of each case, I think. I'm yeah, going to take the last, last. Yeah, last yeah, so uh, question relating to what you're saying about the difficulty of defending and also of the, the trauma of these witnesses, um, the, the, the live witnesses and the victims of the, of the crimes. Um, it seems that cross-examination would be a very unenviable task, so I was wondering how would that play out in court and did the courts impose any restrictions? Um, yeah, it's interesting actually, because in the early days, uh, these individuals, I mean, I mean, you know, in the early days I was prosecuting, I wasn't defending. But frankly, um, you know, I'd be interested to hear Diana's view on this, because she's defended a lot of these cases. I think with the victims, actually, if you're dealing with a leadership case, you're not dealing with a physical perpetrator, I wouldn't cross-examine these witnesses. I just wouldn't do it, because it did happen to them. You know, they have lost limbs. Uh, unless you've got good evidence that they are lying about what happened to them, which has happened in cases where people have lied about what's happened to them. But if you've got somebody that's got a physical manifestation before the court, you know, two missing limbs that have been severed, I wouldn't cross-examine somebody on how that happened, particularly when they would have given an account in chief of how that, of how that happened. As to s limitations, I can't recall, I mean, it's a while, since, uh, you know, not like the formal processes that exist now in English courts for the cross-examination of vulnerable witnesses. Um, it was pretty free, actually, in the early days. And I often wondered why defence lawyers were cross-examining some poor victim endlessly, you know, some poor woman <coughs> talking about the loss of her 17-year-old son who'd been shot in the back of the head. I mean, do we really need to have this cross-examined? I mean, it just makes it worse, frankly. Um, Diana, do you want to... Speak to that. Yes, I think my argument is yeah. that there is very much dependence. Thank you. It's impossible to speak generally. It must depend on the facts of the particular case. Certainly, the case I was dealing with at the ICTR, we did have judges who tried to impose limitations on cross examination in a way that we felt was extremely unfair because. It wasn't a question of idly questioning victims. There were a number of people who came to the courts to lie. And we were told that it was not a proper part of cross-examination to challenge those witnesses. And Rwanda reacted very badly to the challenge to witnesses. And there was a period when they actually stopped witnesses coming to the court because they felt that it was an inappropriate course to take. So that it is a struggle sometimes when uh, there's a good case to be put, good evidence of dishonesty, and there's discouragement from yeah. the judges. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I think we're going to have to wind up now. Please remember, this isn't your last opportunity. Uh, we'll be through in the next room. Uh, in just a moment and, and please feel free to come and speak to Andrew if he'll allow yes. and to anybody else you want to as well. Um, thank you for participating. Thank you Andrew again uh, for the lucid uh, responses uh, to the questions that have been put to you and please let's thank Andrew one more time.